Hey y'all, Coach in the Fight here, guys. Stacy with me. Hello. And in today's class, we're talking about the specifics of baptism. Baptism. What does it truly take to get baptized properly? So that's the emerging into water, right? Oh, we're going to talk about that. I'm glad you said that word because, you know, uh, emerging in water is a subject of controversy when it comes to baptism and that's one of the things that we're going to be talking about whether you have to be submerged in the water or not okay and we're going to give some other details what kind of water who's supposed to do it what are you supposed to do before you get baptized what name you're supposed to get baptized in in this class we're going to give a lot of details on the proper 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 way to get baptized when I first got baptized I remember as a small kid maybe I would say I was about seven or eight and I was remember standing in front of the church um, and being sprinkled on the top of my head with water really yeah oh okay. that was my first baptism my first baptism was in the hills of West Virginia in January and they had a baptismal pool and when we showed up that morning it had two inches of ice on it I remember them breaking that ice and bringing it out of that pool, and I'm sitting there looking like in this white robe, like they're gonna put me in that. Mm -hmm. How old were you? Uh, I was about 16. Okay. But anyway, we're gonna see which one was right, <laughs> <laughs> and if one of us got baptized incorrectly. Okay. And we're gonna see the proper way to do it by way of the scripture. Okay. Now, before we jump over there, um, I do want to look in a couple of books that's coming out of the Gospels, particularly Mark chapter 1 and verse 4. If you would, read that. John did baptize in the wilderness and preach the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Now, this, is, I believe, was the most significant era according to my first baptism was that I didn't know that I was being baptized for the repentance or the remission of sins. Okay. I, I, well, I don't think I did either. I think I was just being baptized because that's what my parents told me yeah, I had me to too. do. me too. They told me to be baptized and I was obedient. Mm -hmm. And that was the reason why. And I believe and I believe that's the case with a lot of people. That's why I wanted to bring this verse out. How important it is. What is actually going on when a person is baptized. Is that they're actually getting the remission of their sins. Okay. So, so does it matter if we know or not? I don't think so. Maybe it does. You got to remember how John, he sent people away because they wasn't repentant. Mm -hmm. He didn't want to baptize them. Mm -hmm. called, called them den vipers and stuff <laughs> like that. But, you know, I believe that when we are baptized, whether we know or not, we still get that remission of sins. Mm. I believe that's why it's frowned upon to baptize children is because they don't know what's going on. Okay. And so they have got that remission of their sins, yet they don't know it. And like me, as a 16-year-old child, ran back and committed more sins the very next day. Right. Mm -hmm. You know? So as teachers and ministers, we should make sure the people that we are baptizing understand that they're getting the remission of their sins so that they're not so quick to run back and dirty themselves up again. Right. Wasting that baptism. Right. Mm -hmm. And for those of us who did, like you and I, and didn't know any better, mm -hmm. we can get baptized all over again. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And we did. And we did. I praise the Lord. I think I'm on my fourth time. <laughs> it wasn't until the last time. It wasn't until the fourth time that I realized what I was actually doing. Mm -hmm. But anyway, let's jump over into the scripture that we're going to be talking about today. And it's coming out of the book called Didache. Okay. Which is the teaching of the 12 apostles. Mm, I've heard you talk about this book. A little bit. Yeah, and I'm putting on the screen there. You can pause and read some of the history of uh, this book. Um, Didache actually means teaching, and it was known as a manual for Christian life. Okay. You know, so mm -hmm. again, this is the 12 apostles. Mm -hmm. This would have been the individuals that walk with the Messiah. Right. And you see here that this is a compilation of their teachings. So they all got together and put together this manual. All right. So this would have been an extremely important document mm -hmm. before we see here that the Catholic Church took it out and said they didn't want anything to do with it. Darn Catholics. Well, it's like they got rid of everything <laughs> that was good for us and left us with, you know, the 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 watered down version watered of down version of everything you know the the whole New Testament is Paulinian doctrine which we know 
is for the Gentiles. Paul was the designated teacher of the Gentiles. Right. So they left out many of the books by Peter and Jude, who would have been the teachers of the Hebrews or the Israelites, mm -hmm. and turned our Bible into a book for Gentiles, yeah. almost. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Still a lot of truth in it, though. It is. Mm -hmm. I mean, they couldn't get rid of everything. They couldn't get rid of Revelations. They couldn't get rid of uh, the book of Exodus. They couldn't get rid of the Gospels. They, 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 you could imagine if they wanted to, our Bible would be only Paul. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And only certain books of Paul. They would have left out books like the Laodiceans and other books that didn't support their doctrine, allowing them to the, the doctrine of liberty. Yeah, it's like when they couldn't get rid of everything and some of the manuscript script survived, now they told us that, or they didn't allow us to read. And when we were allowed to read and some of that slipped in, now in today's age they're telling us that that, that you are reading, it doesn't matter. Yeah, it don't matter. They're going to get raptured away anyway. But anyway... But anyway, we're looking down here in chapter 7, which is all about baptism. Okay. It's only four verses. All right. And we're, but it gives a lot, a lot, a lot of specifics about baptism. I would go on to say that this is the only scriptural document that tells you how to be baptized or how to baptize a person. All right. Let's read it. Well, go ahead. Verse 1. Now concerning baptism, baptized like this. That's kind of blunt. Yeah. It's telling you that, <laughs> like I said, I, I, I've read... Just about every scriptural document known to man. I haven't I haven't read everything, but out of all the little scriptures that I have read, including you know all of the 66 books in the Bible, none of them tell you how to do it. Right. We've given examples, but this is the only book that tells us how to do it. And again, this is written by the people who was taught directly by the Master. Okay. Having first taught all these things, you must baptize candidates in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, in living water, a cold flowing river or stream. A lot of information in there, ain't it? That's a lot. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that would change up a lot of yeah. the way people are baptized. Yeah, just that didn't. one verse. Yeah, we didn't know. But So let's break this down just a little bit. It says, having first taught all of these things. Now, remember we said that this book here is called The Teachings, right? Mm -hmm. And when you look in the first uh, six chapters, that's what you see. It's the teachings from these 12 apostles, 12, okay. 12 disciples. And like you said, it is a manual for Christian living. Okay. It goes on to, you know, touch on the commandments. You see the red letters there is touching on some of the words from the Messiah. Um, it gives a lot of information in here. It's like, like it says, a manual for Christian living. So that's what it's telling us to do here is to Ensure that we understand what's being talked about here, this manual, mm -hmm. you know, so that unlike you and I, we don't go in blind, ignorant of what we're about to do. Mm -hmm. The person who is being baptized will have these instructions knowing what it is that they're getting into. Mm -hmm. And then after they did so, then you go on to baptize them. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's what it says. Having first taught all of these things. Okay. Then it says you must baptize the candidate in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Okay. Now, this right here can get a little bit tricky. Yeah. Because of the names that you use. Yes. But I don't know that it's necessary that we get this absolutely right. Maybe it is. I don't know. I've been baptized in different names. You have? Well, the first time they did it exactly like that. The Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. And one time I was baptized in the name of Jesus He's, Christ. Right. Another time I was baptized in uh, Yehoshua HaMashiach mm -hmm. or something like that. Mm -hmm. But I believe that I got credit for all of them. Okay. I believe that all of them counted. Mm -hmm. Right? And so when the a person is getting baptized, that is part of the discussion that should go on between the person who is doing the baptizing and the person that's being baptized. Right. You know, what are we going to say here? Mm -hmm. You know, are we going to say ex exactly like this or are we going to? Uh, I think it might be safe to just say Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Probably so. But the thing is, when you come over to the book of Acts and chapter two, you see that. Peter was telling them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Right. Right. So, like I said, there just needs to be some discussion there. It does. Mm -hmm. 
But I believe the main point here is that you recognize is that you're being baptized in all three names. Yes. We have to recognize all three. Mm -hmm. You know, we can't be like those who only recognize Jesus. Right. And ignore the Father and ignore the Holy Holy Spirit. Spirit. Right. We can't be that. That would be those of the um, Protestant church or the Catholic church that fall in that group. Mm -hmm. We can't be like the Jews of old or the Jewish community who recognize the father, but they don't recognize the son. Right. Mm -hmm. And we can't be like some other religion that I can't name that only recognize the Holy Spirit, but they don't recognize the other two. Right. We have to recognize all three. And I think that's the point being made here. That's why you're being baptized in all three is because you recognize in all three. You have to recognize all three. Right. Mm Mm-hmm. Now it says in living water. And in cold water. So that kind of backs up that ice on that pool that we were talking about. But yeah, notice how it says in flowing water. And if you remember, the Messiah was baptized in a river. Right. In the River Jordan. Yes. Now how cold that water was, I don't know. I don't know. But it was a flowing stream. Mm-hmm. And I wonder, is there a purpose for the, the, the what is the purpose of the flowing stream, the living water, the not, um, you know, just getting in a pool? That, that's a good question. I don't know. I mean, I can sit here and speculate on it, but maybe we ought to ask the viewers. All right. If you guys would, jump down in the comment section and tell us what you think would be the significance of the flowing water or the stream versus, like you said, a pool or a bathtub. Right. Mm-hmm. But especially when you go on to verse 2, which talks about if this cold flowing stream is not available. Okay. 2 says, and if you do not have living water... Then baptize candidates in still water, a pool. And if you cannot baptize them in cold water, then do so in warmer water. Yeah, so you are given options. Yeah. So it's better to be baptized in the cold flowing water. Mm -hmm. But if you can't get in the stream, just get cold water. And if you don't have cold water available, just use any water that you got. Just get baptized. Just get baptized. That makes me think of uh, Passover. When if you can't. Do the first one, then there's a second one available. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the thing about it, if the rules did not give you these options, how many people would make an excuse? Yeah. I mean, I don't even know where a river is around me. I couldn't find a, I couldn't find a stream big enough to be baptized around me. I don't know where to go. Mm-mm. And then now you will have the excuse as I can't do it. Yeah. I don't have a stream. I live in the desert. Mm-hmm. I can't be baptized because, you know, I live in the mountains and we don't have any streams or whatever. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But no, he's saying you can even use warm water. Or, or you, um, it's the dead of winter and it is that ice and people are like, nah, I can't baptize this little child in that cold ice water. Yeah. Now he's saying you can yeah. baptize in warm water. <laughs> that water too cold. I can't get in there. Okay, mm-hmm. well, fine. We're going to take you down here, downstairs and we're going to get you some water. We're going to baptize you either way. You're going get baptized today so the excuses is taken away all right so let's go on because it looks like in verse 3 he's still talking about water but if you do not have any of these types of water living still cold or warm then pour some water on the candidate's head three times in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy spirit so now this kind of talks about the way you were baptized you say you were sprinkled yeah my first baptism yes this is saying that you could actually pour the water on the head Mm -hmm. now i know a lot of people are choking on this a lot of them spit their coffee out you could imagine wait the scripture says that you could pour the water i thought you had to be immersed i wonder where did they get that these you know back when i was a child did, because no other scripture talks about this. Did they know about this book? Well, you have to remember that the Catholic Church, they hid these books from us, but they still had this information. Mm. So they would have been going by this. And I think that's maybe where they got the example from wow. is the Catholic Church who did know about this. They might not have shared it with us, but they definitely knew about it. Mm. And so they're pouring the water. So maybe they're not in error by pouring that water. Mm. According to what we're reading here, they're not. Mm-hmm. I, and, you know, that jumped out at me as one of the main reasons why I wanted to do this class because I always thought that they were in error for pouring the water on the head or sprinkling the water. Mm-hmm. I thought you had to be immersed. Right. And I'm sure, like I said, a lot of people out there are thinking the same thing. Mm-hmm. But you have to remember that there is no other scripture that tells us how to do it. Right. And what we're doing is we're only going by the examples in the New Testament We're looking at how the Messiah was baptized in the River Jordan. 
So he obviously went under the water. Then we're looking at the other examples in the New Testament where it appears that they all went under the water. Mm -hmm. And so we're thinking that that's how it had to be done. And because this document was suppressed or hidden, we didn't have the truth about the matter. And look like the truth is, is that if you don't have any other option, you can just grab any water and pour it on the person's head three times in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's like they were... They had the truth and they were practicing the truth, but they neglected to share it with anybody else. I think that's a lot of the case. I think a lot of I think that's why the scripture says that your righteousness has to be uh, more than the righteousness of the Pharisees and the Sadducees because they are withholding some information from us. They're not telling us everything, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. And so what we see them do, we have to go beyond what we see them do because they're not showing us everything. Right. And so where they have this hidden information and are following this, we, you know, are doing something else. We are, it's like we are, because like you said, because they have this information, this hidden information and they're following it and we don't, now we're making it much harder than it actually is. Than it actually and is. And we're not doing it because it is so hard. Well, they're knowing that, you know, you can... You're, you're, you're within your rights to sprinkle and we're like no I gotta have this running river to, in order to baptize so now I'm not gonna get baptized when yeah. all you had to do was do the sprinkle yeah so you know this is why it's important to embrace all of the scripture not just what's set aside by the Catholic Church in that book we call the Bible mm -hmm. you have to look at all the scripture that our father has provided for us because like what it says over there in 2 Timothy 3 and 16, go ahead and read that. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. All scripture, not just the 66 books, like I said, the ones that they decided would be included in our Bible. All scripture. And like we're saying back over here at this book, the Dachi, when we come back to... The introduction part of this book, you see right there is how it says some Christians thought this book was inspired Holy Scripture, but the church rejected it when making the final decision. So it was the church that decided not to include this in the New Testament. But like we saw over there in Timothy, that doesn't take away from the importance, the inspiration of this book is still necessary for our doctrine, reproof, correction and instruction, even our righteousness. But anyway, let's go on. Number four. But before baptism, let the baptizer and the candidate fast, and any others who can join them. But you shall command the candidate to fast for one or two days before they are baptized. You remember fasting before you got baptized? No, I do not. You don't remember <laughs> this book being taught either. We So this is information that we are now learning is that we are supposed to fast before mm -hmm. we get baptized and I think it's talking about the Isaiah 58 type fast okay maybe it's talking about abstaining from food I don't know mm -hmm. I would personally do both at this point mm -hmm. understanding what I know about fasting right. and I would actually you know consider doing both the Isaiah 58 fast mm -hmm. because one thing that that does is it now um, allows you to um, go in and start doing things and I guess sort of like justifying when you go in before him to repent and stuff like that well yeah you remember the um, of course the abstaining from food it really doesn't do anything as far as our spirit it's more like right. a, a bodily thing it kind of you know opens up our awareness or whatever but when you jump over to Isaiah 58 and you look at that kind of fast where you're actually doing charitable deeds for your brother and you know actually doing stuff that you know our father you know um, recognizes as charity as a fast um, actually has a greater benefit and so it does a lot of good as far as you know our spirit is concerned when we're getting ready to be baptized right mm -hmm. 
I believe that helps solidify the fact that we're about to get the remission of our sins, mm -hmm. you know, because, you know, that's one way of uh, uh, getting our sins forgiven is by doing charitable deeds. Yes. And that's what the Isaiah 58 fast is all about, doing charitable what, deeds. And that's what baptism is all about, yeah. the remission of our sins. Yeah, like we read about over there in Mark, that's what it's all, that's what's actually happening. That's the per I mean, you're not just doing something for a symbolic thing, you know. You know, doing you know for a rite or you know a religious practice, it actually does something for your spiritual walk. I personally believe, from what I, everything that I've read, that what's happening there is when you get baptized and all of the previous sins that you have committed have been canceled out, you have now removed that distance that block that blockade that separates us from our consciousness where our father lives because we have a clean slate we can now hear from our conscious again therefore we can actually hear from the father who is speaking to us from within well that's what water does it cleanses it, it cleanses. washes and what better way what better um, element to use other than water? Than water, right? So it's cleansing away our, our sins. And so now it makes us clean enough to where we can actually stand in the presence of our Father. Mm -hmm. And it's, so it's telling here that the candidate should fast for one or two days before they get baptized. But also the baptizer should <laughs> fast as well. But the baptizer should bat to fast as well and even the onlookers. Mm, okay. And See, others right? who can join them. Anybody else that can join them. So if you are about to get baptized, um, then I would fast too, because I'm gonna be standing there at your baptism. Right. And so I would I would I would fast too for you know a day or two, just like you do. Right. So everybody is fasting before this event. Okay. And that's what we have on baptism. That that's you like I said, is this is the only instruction. I mean, we could jump over to the book of Hermes, which Gives us details on what the purpose of baptism is all about. Right. Which, and but it doesn't say anything different. It just says it's for the remission mm -hmm. or the forgiveness of our sins. Right. But this is the only chapter in all of scripture that I've ever read that actually tells us how to do it and what we're supposed to be doing when it comes to baptism. And so I just wanted to share this with everybody. Yeah, with this here scripture, there's no guessing. It comes straight out and tells us, you know. Baptized like this. Yeah, it tells exactly. It tells us this is how you do it. Like you, like you said, baptized like this. Maybe we ought to make that the title of the video. Baptized like this. Do it like this. Yeah. This is this is how you do it. You know, you don't do it no other way because um, this is what the scripture says. And you know, of course, we want to do it according to the scripture. You know, and the way it tells us to do it. That's the way the Father wanted us to do it. All right. So with that, I guess we're going to wrap this thing up. Unless you got anything else you want to add? I've heard you talk about this book before. Um, and I have heard you um, talk about the baptism, but I did not know the part about fasting. Yeah, and I'll probably um, put a link to this book down in the uh, comment section or um, maybe in the description of this video. Because like we read up there in chapter 7, one of the first things you want to do is read this manual, this mm. Christian manual, understanding what you're getting into. Yeah, read it in context so that you'll have um, um, information about what you're doing um, before you're even baptized. That's right. Yeah. All right. And with that, I guess we're going to close it out. And we'll see you guys in the next class. See you in the next class. Shalom.